this panel that we have over here is going to speak about something that's very important to all MSMEs and something that everyone is always talking about at any SME conclave, which is credit access, right? access to credit. The panel is re-strategizing credit access for MSMEs in Amritkal. Of course, uh, you heard our speakers before this talking about, you know, Vixit Bharat 2047 and how MSMEs are going to be contributing to uh, that segment. And I have a very esteemed panel over here. Ms. Benefar Jahani, business head of Crystal, uh, Prashant Mudu, founder and CEO of Jakarta, uh, Mr. Raman Nagarwal, director and former chairman of the Finance Industry Development Corporation, and of course, uh, Mr. Sandeep Parma, CEO Credit Guarantee Trust for Micro and Small Enterprises, CGT MSC, which uh, <coughs> Mr. Rajesh just spoke about, and how they are guaranteeing you know, access to credit for MSMEs. So let me, since it's International Women's Day, I would like to, of course, start with <laughs> Banapa. Uh, how do you see this need for, especially at Crystal, grading uh, of MSMEs and its importance, you know, for raising uh, credit? Why is it necessary to grade MSMEs? Firstly, thanks a lot for having me out here today, Roshan, Sandeep, and the entire FE team out. And uh, a very good morning to everyone present out here. Uh, coming to your question, Roshan, uh, you know, there are varied reasons and how SME grading really helps uh, the SMEs as well as the MSMEs. Firstly, let me put it like this, uh, you know, the process is pretty rigorous. Uh, the process is really valued by all simply because it's a 360 degree assessment uh, of the SME or the MSME. Uh, so firstly, it involves right from evaluating uh, the management, evaluating the business, as well as evaluating the financials of the company. So clearly the process adds a lot of value to the SME and the MSME because then they know clearly where they stand. It's absolutely an independent assessment done by us where we have no conflict of interest whatsoever. And as part of the process, clearly they also know other than where they stand, also because the process is rigorous, they get a sense of where they stand vis-a-vis -vis others and what really needs to be done by them. And since this is an annual exercise wherein we grade them and it's valid for a period of one year, again, at the end of the grading exercise and when they come to us the following year mm -hmm. and they do a regrading, then they know again exactly where do they stand, have they really improvised or not. So in a way, it acts as a self-evaluation tool, a self-evaluation mechanism. And what more than anyone actually highlighting to you that what you really need to do and hence how would you improvise. That's one part of it. The other bit of it is that grading exercise, the entire grading report, it's because it's a detailed report, the SME can and the MSME can actually show that report, one, to the lenders, and the lenders really value it simply because it's an independent evaluation, as well as it's a very detailed evaluation. It, in fact, as part of the process, also involves uh, having our people go out and field, uh, taking pictures, all of that. So it's all details are uh, put in as part of the report. The other bit of it, the SME can use it with all his other stakeholders. When I say all his other stakeholders, his vendors that he's dealing with. So the vendors also get a lot of comfort that yes, this SME that they're dealing with is really sound, right? And obviously it has all possible details, so he gets everything in, in one go, right? Likewise, if the SME is dealing in the export market, it gives a lot of comfort to people sitting overseas who are not even there in India, right? So all in all, because of all these aspects, so all the stakeholders, be it the lending community, be it his vendors, or even his customers who are sitting overseas get a lot of comfort. So all in all, it acts as a self-evaluation tool as well as it gives a lot of credibility to that particular SME as well as MSME. Okay. Uh, Sandeep, if I was to come to you, um, Mr. Rajini spoke about the uh, CGT MSE and how you're you know, supporting uh, small, especially micro enterprises in guaranteeing credit. Um, so th this is going to be a large chunk of the economy, getting them all into the formal economy as we grow. So how do you evaluate the risk over here and when, you're, when you're guaranteeing credit? See, basically uh, ours is a second uh, tier of intermediation. Uh, the Primarily, the risk has to be taken by the by the primary lending institution. The mechanism is like this. 
the MSEs, that micro and small enterprises, they approach the bank, the bank provides them the credit, and just to secure their loan, because the collateral may not be available, as we all know that the biggest hurdle in getting a loan from the bank is the availability of uh, collateral. collateral. Yeah. And precisely for that reason, CGMC had been established in year 2000. So once the bank decides that uh, without collateral also the loan could be given, of course the RBI guidelines are there that loans up to 10 lakh uh, collateral need not be taken upon. Uh, um, but the bankers have to take a call and then subsequently the bankers come to us for coverage of their loans and we step into the shoes of the borrower and instead of borrower providing the collateral, we provide the guarantee to, to the lending institution that in the event of the account going bad, yeah. then we make good, uh, varying from, as uh, Mercy was telling, that uh, varying from 75% to 85% and in some cases where we have state government collaboration, the percentage go even higher. What are the corpus that you have for this? Uh, we have a corpus. The corpus is provided by uh, two entities. Of course, the Government of India, Ministry of MSME is the uh, prime settler. And the second is SIDB. We have a total corpus of about 16,500 crore, out of which 15,500 crore has come from the government and 1,000 uh, crore has come from, uh, from SIDB. So this is how the guarantee mechanism works because it gives you the power of leveraging. So rather than helicopter dropping of money, the government gives money uh, like a drip irrigation, the money goes where it is actually needed. And you need the money only when the account becomes bad. So instead of giving a, a, a broad brushing entire thing, you give support only where it is most needed. Right. right. In fact, uh, giving support where it's most needed, I'd like to come to Prashant. Uh, you know, the technical aspect of it, the money going directly to the uh, MSME, right? Um, so, here you're bringing in technology to guarantee that the funds reach the right person. Um, so, how are you making sure that uh, the, the funds get to the person? What are the kind of, if you can give me a broad overview of how, the kind of technology that you use here. Yeah, so, uh, I think from a tech uh, landscape, um, see, we work primarily with uh, financial institutions. They are yeah. our customers and uh, we largely enable them to transform digitally to be able to provide timely access uh, and using, you know, the government has set up a fantastic digital public infrastructure on which we can ride and we can utilize a lot of that. So, um, so that's primarily the area that we deal. So first is a layer of technology, which includes obviously security, uh, the ability to be able to, you know, do it yourself. So MSMEs can go online to any of the lenders, put in their information, maybe get an eligibility check quickly done so that they know, you know, what they could possibly get. Um, all right. So one is to uh, enable a tech layer for the financial institutions to be able to provide access to credit immediately. The second is, uh, you know, I think a layer of where we are able to leverage the data that the MSME has. Uh, so it could be the GST data, their bank statement data, using the public infrastructure uh, where today now you have the open, uh, you, yeah, you have the account aggregator framework where consent led, I'm able to share my bank statements uh, in real time. So to be able to process all of, so one is to move this data in a secure, consented way between uh, institutions. Uh, and two, to be able to provide immediately to the SME an indication of what they could potentially get. Uh, and then to help the lender evaluate all of this data in real time to be able to give that decision. So, uh, so there's multiple layers. So one is a secure in enterprise uh, kind of a layer. There is a second layer, which is a public infrastructure layer, which has all the account aggregator protocols, which has your OKEN, which is the open credit enablement network, yeah. which standardizes um, these data exchange layers. And then the third is actually collecting all of this vast information and being able to model it and decision it almost in real time so that an MSME can uh, you know, potentially know what they're eligible for. And in some, some cases, lenders have gone so far as to say the money should be in the account within six hours of that decision actually happening. And, and we have certain clients that are uh, delivering that promise. So I think in that those are the three layers that are at work. Um, and I think it's the combination of these layers that is also potentially going to drive access to credit tremendously as we go forward over the next few years. Right. So, I mean, so we've heard the technology side of it. We've heard the credit guarantee. If I have to come to you, uh, Mr. Raman Agarwal, 
uh, you've worked with, uh, you know, seen so many NBFCs and their role in uh, bridging the credit gap. If you could just give me a broad overview first of where the, the role NBFCs actually play here, especially for uh, MSMEs and more on the micro side. Thank you. And uh, uh, let me first wish everybody a happy Women's Day and a Mahashivratri. As they say, it's a confluence of two Shaktis today, <laughs> the Shiv Shakti and the Nari Shakti. So let's hope uh, things really go well. And yes, see, uh, let me tell you, truly, I believe that NBFCs and MSMEs are sectors made for each other. I'll tell you why. Because historically, NBFCs have been known to cater to the underbanked or the unbanked segment of the society. That means the risk taking capacity or the ability is higher as compared to the banks. And that is where uh, we see uh, the MSME credit, the NBFC share in the MSME credit really going up. If you pick up the last RBA report, it said that the growth of the NBFC credit to MSMEs has grown three times more than that for banks. So that itself speaks because, see, there are two aspects. One, the greater reach which NBFCs have to the ground level and the higher risk taking capacity. So that is where, uh, you know, for NBFCs to grow, it is the MSMEs, which is the segment really ideally suited and vice versa for MSMEs. I think the best starting point for getting a formal credit from the formal system, it's the NBFCs. So that's how the two are placed. Okay. Right. Um, so just to take this further, I'm coming back to uh, Benefa. You know, um, you spoke about the grading system for MSMEs. But what's, in your opinion, what's the awareness level that something like this actually exists? And I understand Crystal is working with, you know, larger corporates to try and drive this uh, grading system to their vendors, suppliers. So how are you going about this? Because I think awareness is still very low that there is a, a grading system for MSMEs. Yeah. yeah. So, Roshan, let me put it like this. Uh, you know, it goes that little medium to, you know, mid to little larger SMEs uh, are clearly aware about SME uh, grading, right? And that's simply because if today you have the lending community ask for it and which we have a good number of uh, you know banks as well as NBFCs asking for it. So typically how it goes is that you have the SME approaching the lending community and they are asking them that why don't you get a grading done and post that basis the report and the findings of the report they decide that they want to go ahead with the particular you know lending or they don't want to go ahead with it. So simply, you know, I, I would put it that if more and more banks and the lending community tends to ask for it, I think that will be a faster mechanism for these SMEs to really, and the MSMEs, the smaller size ones, to really know about it and to ask for it. Uh, the erstwhile regime wherein we had NSIC really subsidizing the, you know, the entire thing, somewhere it was much more popular for that reason. I think now it's up to us also and, and we also consciously, you know, in Crystal also we consciously take this call that why not we should go around and tell people about it. Simply because not only on the grading part of it, but also because it's a self, uh, self evaluation tool. I think that will also help them and more importantly, it'll help them to up, you know, more majorly to up them. And I think that's more important. So you might have today various, various schemes also the government is looking at. I think somewhere the focus needs to be on improving their skills, uh, you know, taking them to the next level. Now, clearly, if I step, you know, step back one, uh, you know, and see that how, how for today, what kind of challenges an SME faces. One is obviously on the financing bit. But more importantly, uh, you know, the SME sector being highly unorganized. And today, if you look at the various activities that one has to do as part of the regular business, you can't expect an SME to be the best in class in all aspects. So be, be it technology, be it on the compliance side, ensuring that they have a good market reach and if they want to go to the overseas also, it gets even more difficult. Right. So all in all, I think, uh, you know, when an activity like a grading also steps in, it actually is an eye opener for the guy that he can also look at varied, uh, you know, schemes by the government also and varied consultants, varied external parties, they can look at the know-how and imbibe that rather than trying to create it because it's absolutely not possible for them to create it. Likewise, on the other side, also, if you were to look at, uh, you know, them getting the best in class labor today, it's very difficult. You can't get in and more importantly, it's difficult for them to even retain, uh, you know, the skilled labor and then further train them. 
so all in all i'll put it like this that you know they could actually use external know how external expertise and then up themselves i think that's going to be more critical that we uh, ensure that we bring the smes msmes up right up the learning curve okay uh, uh, as this uh, graduate is getting implemented by and as have they discontinued yeah they have discontinued the subsidy so we do the grading we no longer call it rating so erstwhile it was called sme rating where the government was subsidizing it so we had nsic paying for it not the entire sum but a, a large proportion of it around 60 to 70% but since that scheme had moved off today an sme does approach us but he has to pay the entire fees in its entirety so of course there is that burden also on a relatively smaller sme he might not want to put in that kind of money No, so the only difference is rating is when it is regulated. You have an entity who is supporting a regulator behind the entire thing, versus a grading, which is more. It's a non-mandatory activity where you can come ahead and get yourself graded. Yeah, and that and that brings me back to, um, Mr. Sandeep. You know, um, depending on the grading of, of MSMEs, how much of that do you take into account? when uh, your with your guarantees also if you could give me an indication of the kind of npas you're seeing in the uh, sme segment and how that impacts uh, the credit that you get from lenders like from banks see as i said that uh, the primary uh, responsibility of selecting the borrower lies with the bank so it is the bank who has to take care or the lending institution including nbfcs who has to take care about the assessment of the repaying capacity of the borrower so for me the only criteria that we put in that uh, it should be a, a, a non investment it should not be in non investment grade for for the for a particular banker and uh, they 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 can cover the cases under guarantee for me you'll appreciate that the uh, for me the customer is the lending institution and not the borrower because uh, it would not be possible for us also to directly rate the borrower and it will be like reinventing the wheel suppose a borrower is there who has already been rated or who has already been assessed by the sbi or uh, sdfc and all it will not make any sense that if i go and do it again so what we do we rate the bankers instead because for me the bankers are the customer because i deal with the bankers i do not deal with the borrower so i deal with the bankers depending upon their performance with me not at the global level how they are doing it is their behavior with me because this is quite possible that the bank is doing quite good in their balance sheet they have very less uh, uh, nps in their book but just imagine what happens if the entire nps they may be having only 0.25% and 0.5% but entire npa lands in my door so for me it becomes essential that i rate the uh, the uh, lending institution and uh, accordingly i put the risk bucketing we have uh, seven risk bucketing okay. and we put all the mlis i uh, mlis in different buckets and accordingly we charge the guarantee fee from uh, from them the second question that you asked about the npas so the npas are in the range of 10 to 12% for us which is almost in line with what the segment uh, experiences on a global level i mean you'll have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that we deal only with the micro and small we do not even deal with the medium so the micro and small even at the uh, broader level the npas would be in that range only so i don't see any significant change between uh, a portfolio which is covered by CHGMC which is not covered by CHGMC so that the question uh, always this question comes in that whether CHGMC or any guarantee scheme brings in an element of moral hazard so my answer is a big no because the guarantee only improves your lgd the loss given default that is improved the pd remains unaffected so any banker worth his salt he would not like its gnpa the gross uh, npa to go up i can only help in maintaining the nnpa but gnpa will go up so that question of moral hazard is not there but still our motto is or what we keep telling the bankers that is the guarantee for the loans if you are deciding to give a loan then take guarantee it is not it shouldn't be the other way around it shouldn't be the loan for the guarantee just just because the guarantee is there you go and uh, give a loan in any case that doesn't happen but this has been our motto right and uh, since you mentioned npas then today being uh, international women's day there was a statistic that women owned companies the npas are much lower is that true it's true it's true in our uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, 
in CGMC entire coverage, uh, the women uh, share of women entrepreneurs was less. It was about 17 percent. Then since it is again, you, as you mentioned, it's a women's day, so I can also share some of the things that we have done. What we did that we made uh, uh, loaning to women entrepreneurs a bit easier by relaxing our norms. So in case of women entrepreneurs, the coverage is higher. We provide 85 percent coverage and the, the cost also is reduced. We give 10 percent uh, reduction in the, uh, in the cost of uh, guarantee fee. So as a result, we are seeing a surge in the coverage and uh, something which used to be 17 percent, it has gone up to 22 percent. So 22 percent coverage, I still feel it's quite low. I mean, com considering that uh, they constitute 50 percent of uh, our population largely. So even 22% is less, but we are moving in that direction. And as you said, uh, the NPA percentage is lesser for women entrepreneurs vis-a-vis -vis their male counterparts. Okay, that, that's interesting to know. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Prashant, Professor, come to you. Uh, if you can just give me um, the use case of, you have something called the Jakarta Economic Index, yes. right? And so the use case over there, and again, uh, grading or rating of SMEs and how you can use that index to detect whether uh, a company is likely to default or not. So uh, so one of the things uh, at Jakarta that we've been passionate about is uh, the analysis of data. And one of the things that, you know, obviously in the MSME space is uh, how much data was available historically, the transparency of that information, the accuracy of that information. And so when, um, uh, and I'll, I'll just give you a little history of how this came about. So when GST came up, we thought, um, you know, given the information that was available uh, on consent of the MSME, which is provided through an OTP, um, that data available digitally was a treasure trove of information because I was understanding on one side uh, who the suppliers were and on the other side, uh, so the buyers and sellers, because on GST you get both of that uh, information. So we were able to uh, very quickly using a lot of machine learning uh, and modeling techniques, uh, statistical modeling techniques, uh, be able to create uh, a behavioral score, if you will, okay. uh, for MSMEs. Uh, this is adopted by various very large scale public sector, private sector institutions that look at it from a fraud perspective, a monitoring perspective, uh, look at it from a behavioral perspective. And in fact, when they started looking at this data and mapping it to performance default, they found that the correlation was extremely high. Uh, because, and so that's where, you know, and then, um, you know, uh, one of the big private sector banks introduced us to SIDB. Right. Uh, and Mr. Raman was excited by what we showed him. And um, so we first implemented all of this on SIDB's portfolio. And we saw that our score was able to correlate with defaults of even less than uh, one, 1%. One uh, and much lower, actually, 0.6 percent, roughly. Uh, and so then we had this collectively idea. Uh, he's very passionate about looking at data and analyzing data and, and using it. So we came up with this idea with SIDB. Uh, what if we were to aggregate this at a country level across the institutions that we work together with, and create an economic activity index for MSMEs, uh, which we call Jokata Sampoon, which is in association with SIDB. Uh, we publish it on a monthly level. This is an index that uh, <clears throat> is measured from 0 to 1. Anything above 0.5 shows that the MSME economy for the country is in expansion and their grades of expansion over 0.5 and below that are uh, in contraction. Uh, it was inaugurated by the Ministry of Finance by the Chief Economic Advisor. Uh, and we've seen some fantastic progress uh, on that index, the consumption of that index by the uh, financial industry and by the ministry themselves, uh, the finance ministry. Uh, but what it has given is a macro view of the MSME economy, uh, which um, was was available by, you know, like people use a PMI right. uh, and then things are. But this is something with actual economic sales data, concentrated sales data on the ground. So uh, we think that this picture is very accurate um, and a true reflection of that economy. Uh, but what it has also provided for the banks and the financial institutions is they are understanding which way the economy is moving, which industries are seeing either a surge or a slump, uh, where they could uh, probably direct capital uh, to help with um, you know any intervention that is required on a timely level, and that's where even a SIDB steps in. We are now engaging with states to be able to look at individual indices at the state level uh, to be able to help in better policy decisioning, uh, policy making as well, yeah. um, you know, and so and now we can compare it, right? so we can say. 
uh, here is a Ludhiana textile cluster versus a Tamil Nadu textile cluster. How are they performing? Where do we need to intervene? Uh, what are the factors? So, um, yeah, so I think uh, it's groundbreaking work in terms of uh, what we're doing and we are helping better decisioning, better direction of capital, uh, more timely access to capital, right. uh, using data and analyzing really large amounts of data uh, at scale. So. Um, yeah, it's it's a very exciting uh, space for us, and and you know we're very happy that um, you know CDB is uh, partnered with us on this, and uh, and and we're and we're really taking it, you know, both using it in the government, using it in the private sector, to be able to aid decision making uh, and monitoring uh, in that sense. So. Right. Uh, Okay. So that's uh, what we're broadly doing in that okay. space. Uh, uh, for the uh, SMEs in the room, if you could just uh, uh, highlight how this could be accessed. This, uh, the yeah, so uh, it's just sampoon.in. That is the website. You can just go on, uh, register. All the data is publicly available. We're very transparent about this. Uh, so someone can go to sampoon.in, subscribe every month in your inbox. You will actually get uh, the index itself, what the index means. Uh, and you know all the you know how we built it, uh, different cuts of data across state, across industry. So plastics, iron, you know, iron and steel, uh, auto. So all of the industries are are represented there. Um, and and you know there's, there's and we do several things. I mean, uh, one of the things that we're going to come out uh, again since it's Women's Day, I'll mention it. We are we're actually going to come out with uh, some porn index for women entrepreneurs, which we're going to launch with CDB here uh, end of this year. To see how has credit facilitation been towards MSMEs that are run by women, uh, and how are they performing? And uh, so there are various cuts of data. So we're going to do a cut for data specifically for the micro sector, so up to five crores. Uh, so how are they performing vis-a-vis -vis the larger index in the country? So um, yeah, so all of this information is available online. Sampoon is S U M P W O R N Sampoon dot in, uh, and it's also there on Sidbi's website. So you could go to Sidbi's website and also look it up from there. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of exciting work coming down that uh, road for us. Right. Uh, Mr. Raman, if I was to come to you, um, is, there, is there a need for uh, change in regulations, especially <clears throat> given that uh, lending for large SMEs and for micro is more or less the same? Is there, need, uh, is there a need for change in regulations here? So yeah, I think you've touched upon a very, very sensitive and important aspect. So let me, I'll just take a few minutes to explain. See, I think... Uh, we need to have some sense of you know practicality being crept in. On one side, we have you know, with due respect, the regulator and all the financial entities following the international Basel norms for banking, and that is where you talk of the international financial stability, and you have the norms prescribed, the NPA norms, and further we have the stamping norms. And if you, I would here you know, point out to a circular issued by RBI way back in November 21, where they said strictly day and stamping. So that would mean that today for an MSME borrower, so typically we follow a 90 day NPA norm. Yeah. So, you know, if today is the 90th day and this guy doesn't pay up, so the norm says that, okay, before you close your accounts today, you need to tag that account as an NPA today. So that means strictly 90th day, he gets a NPA tag. Number two, in order to revive back that NPA account to a standard account, he needs to pay the entire amount. So if 100 rupees is due in principal interest included, he has to pay 100 all. Prior to this, let me share that we in the NPFC sector, at least this was not for banks, mm. as I said, being slightly flexible, we used to be flexible to the extent that, okay, if say 20th, 22nd is the due date, we used to normally stretch it up to the month end because all small time borrowers the tend to pay repay by the month end. Secondly, in order to re, uh, reclassify back from NPA to standard, even if 60 rupees was paid out of 100, we used to classify back to standard because technically you are out of that 90 day norm. Now, this is financial jargon. Let's talk practical. The, in fact, some time back I wrote an article on this that there is a case here to have a borrower-centric guidelines rather than lender-centric guidelines. Today, you have norms prescribed for banks, for NBFCs, for cooperative banks, for small finance banks, for DFIs like SIDB, etc. Where are the, you know, the norms are prescribed based on the respective strengths and weaknesses. The, I think the dynamics need to change because 
let's agree on one simple fact that every small borrower, every small MSMEs, the cash flows are very, very fragile. Any small activity, pandemic was a huge, was a black swan event. But even a small thing happening, somebody falling sick in the family, or even somebody, you know, there is a marriage in the family, something happening at the local level could be a natural phenomena, could be a man-made phenomena. The first impact that happens is on the cash flows of the small time bar. So why I'm saying this is that, is it practical to have same prudential norms for a person borrowing one lakh rupee versus a corporate borrower borrowing 500 crores of rupees? Why are we having the same potential set of norms for both these entities? When we know that the poor chap, the small MSMEs, cash flows are extremely fragile. By doing so, what we are doing is that we are giving him that NPA tag strictly on the 90th day and then expecting him to repay the entire amount to come off it. In other ways, we are actually excluding him out of the system. Because let's agree, once an NPA tag is a black mark, you are untouchable. So I think here is a case to prescribe, you know, have the market small borders. We, we, we at FIDC had written to government of India and suggested a benchmark of two crores. Now, you will ask me how this two crores came. Hmm. If you remember during the COVID time when that moratorium issue came up, right. crept up, government of India had come up with that benchmark of, you know, threshold level of two crores. So if we said, let's follow that two crores. Up to two crores of ticket size loans, let these small borrowers be treated differently. And let's not have the same strict norms. So I think there is a case, at least, I mean, I'm not talking of global, at least in India, let's not blindly follow the Western norms. And let's, I'm not saying for NBACs, I'm saying for all lenders, let be borrower-centric. Chote borrower ke potential norms alag hone chahiye vis-a-vis corporate large borrowers. That is the most important change. And that will have a far reach because what we are doing here today, the moment you prescribe such stringent norms, you know, as I said, it happened on November 21, hmm. you are directly impacting the risk taking capacity of the lender. Because ultimately, I am also answerable to my investors, to my stakeholders. So, what will I do is in order to improve the health of my balance sheet, I will also tend to move away from the high risk segment to a lower risk. Lower, yeah. So, there is need to be a conceptual change at the regulation level. I think this is the most important and cried need of the art. Right. So, I mean, like for an individual, it's probably your Sybil score where you have the Absolutely. same problem. Absolutely. Uh, with, with an MSME. So, a small borrower ko aap ek bade large borrower ke saath barabar treat nahi kar sakte, especially when you talk of, you know, asset quality or tagging him in NPA. I'm sorry, we know NPA tag in our country is as good or as bad as a black mark. You are a black mark in the credit market. In fact, this is where I should bring in uh, Binafar. You think Thrizzle can help with something like this? Yeah, in fact, I just wanted to step in, but I was just holding <laughs> on. Uh, you know, clearly when we also do an assessment, okay, why we are first of all calling it SME grading, as I said, so that banks are not impacted by the provisioning norms, right? That's one. Two is, as, as rightly called out, we cannot be looking at larger entities having the same, uh, you know, expectation from a small entity. So we are very much mindful of that when we do an SME grading also. So, in fact, just drawing parallel, I'm also right now on the, on the committee where we actually, we were trying to explore uh, that how do we see and how do we grade startups? And the same question came in, where I said there is even more scary if one were to look at financial aspects of a startup, you'll eventually say that none of them pass, right? But so, you can't losses. put the same brush on all and expect the same, uh, you know, because obviously the risk taking ability will be different. So, you'll have to be very clear if you're, say, for example, looking at a startup, the risk will be highest. MSME, it'll be here because obviously each of them have their pluses and minuses. So, ab absolutely, we will have to then, and we can definitely look at something like that. But obviously, it'll be that one will have to clearly communicate. So, it, it's more about expectation and setting the expectation right to all, right? Yeah. That if you are dealing with this category, these are the aspects you will focus on. Close your eyes for startups, for example. Do not look at financials. Yes, you will have to burn money in initial years. Okay. You get a, and then you do a grading, then it becomes much more simpler. So, definitely we can solve that issue. You know, the key element and the most important word here is flexibility. Right. For a small-time borrower, small-time MSME, you cannot be rigid. You have to be flexible. That is the most important aspect. 
Any questions from the audience? Because this, uh, yeah. yeah. Can you get a mic, please? Uh, no, it is very nearby. <laughs> Still. So, uh, my question is that he, uh, from morning to this. Uh, it's on. Will it not be better if some a successful MSc, MSME entrepreneur would have been in this panel also? That is what I am thinking. Other part of the story. Right. We actually will have later in the day, we have uh, included that. <laughs> Prashant, and, Prashant. And we have, we have, we have he, Prashant. He, he is a successful he, entrepreneur. He is a successful entrepreneur. <laughs> Jokata is… Uh, what was your experience? That is my uh, expectation to… Learn. No, so they are absolutely right. I, I mean, for uh, no bank would touch me for six or seven years, okay. uh, you know. So, I, I think I completely echo everything that both of them have said. Uh, it's true. We… Uh, and I… Uh, till this date, we've not gotten, uh, you know, access to credit from a financial institution though we've been there for 10 years and um, I, yeah, and, uh, and we're well established. We have 700 people in four cities and all of that. But see, they're right because the predictability is difficult uh, in a startup. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think there needs to be a, a, a relook at that. Um, and just to touch upon, I think both of them, in fact, we don't even grade and we don't think it is correct or right enough to grade and SM, MSME till the first two years because, uh, and I would even argue a little longer because it takes time to set up all of this, to look at all of it and um, yeah, so, but we've had to go out and obviously now with, startup is a very sexy thing today, it wasn't 10 years ago when I started, uh, uh, it, it was really hard to get funds but uh, today there's a lot of cash available through the venture capital route and through debt equity, I mean through the debt route. So. Uh, from from private players, so uh, yeah, that that's true. But I would I would agree with everything that they they said in that sense. Reminds me a scene of film Aadhaar Shila, where Masudin she Shah went for uh, finance for his movie, and the bank manager said, "Have you made movie?" And then he <laughs> comes out and he fires that had I made the movie, I never needed the loan. <laughs> exactly. It's a catch-22 situation for entrepreneurs. In fact, I just wanted to ask Sandeep uh, quickly to wrap up because we're almost out of time. Any role that uh, CGT MSE can play here in kind of expanding this, especially when we're talking about, uh, you know, NPAs? And no, definitely it can be done. And uh, I mean, uh, just to take it forward, what uh, these three people have been saying, uh, bankers being very reluctant to lend to a particular section, particularly startups and all, it has some wider ramification. It's not entirely for the same regulation and all. We have to see beyond that also. Because startups are a different creature altogether. Uh, a, a normal banker who, who is into a debt financing kind of a thing, suddenly you ask him to do a, a venture uh, financing. It, it would be difficult for him. He will not be able to appreciate. Because the bankers are, right from the beginning, they have been told to assess two things. One is the ability to repay and the second one is the intention to repay. I mean, that is the sum and substance of any assessment that you do. So ability to repay, at least, uh, I mean, uh, intention to repay can be done. I mean, you see the person, you can do it and all. But ability to repay, there lies the catch when you go for something which is very abstract and, uh, you know, the startup where the securities are not there and all those things are not there, it becomes difficult. Their CGTMSC, of course, can play a very important role. We have been playing. Of course, uh, 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 primarily we have been met, uh, meant for micro and small. So my mandate is limited to, to loan amounts uh, up to rupees 5 crore. So up to 5 crore, I provide the assistance that wherever you feel shaky about the uh, ability to repay, so there I step in and I provide the guarantee so that whatever reluctance is there, that uh, that is removed. But Yes, I mean, the, the same um, experiment or the same model can be applied to a different kind of a thing also. I mean, uh, I, I'm sure you are uh, aware that uh, a guarantee scheme for startups also uh, has been uh, announced. It is working. Of course, I'm not maintaining that. I mean, managing that. That is being managed by NCGTC and uh, DPIIT has established. And uh, there they have made, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, AIFs also as eligible MLIs. See, Primarily, there is a very thin difference between a startup and MSMEs. I mean, if you go strictly as by the definition, 
almost all uh, startup will uh, will qualify as uh, MSMEs, yeah. MSCs. The reverse may not be true. Yeah. So otherwise, also if the loan is up to five crore and it is being given to a startup, they can come to me. But having said that, there is a specific scheme also, and this uh, guarantee mechanism can really be extended to large uh, b loans also. I mean, there is no reason because I firmly believe that this concept of collateral that has to go one day. I mean, uh, DC sir said and uh, others were also talking that 2047. So my thinking is that the credit creation is an infinite ask for us. I mean, this has to be uh, uh, multiplied and year on year it has, go, it has to go on. And if we are going to make this credit creation based on collateral, which is a finite thing, so you cannot achieve something which is infinite, riding on a finite thing. So ultimately, there has to be a mechanism uh, which is infinite in nature to support that ask. And there comes uh, a guarantee mechanism, whether it is CHMAC or anybody else, because a time will come where no collateral will be available. I mean, there won't be any land available in the country to, you know, uh, unincome. But so we have to think about that time. Today right. it may be available and all. And today also the problem started coming in. You know, the bigger cities, you don't have anything, the prices are no, going yes. up, and because of that, the artificial pricing is happening. Yeah. So once you go for a stretch, uh, so this also does not give comfort to the banker, because at the time of uh, when everything is hanky-dory, the price is very, very high. But when you go to, uh, you kind of realize this, so it is something else. So we always keep telling that at the sanction time it is 100 rupees, at the time of NPA the value becomes 60, at the time of resolution become 40. So that also makes bankers very, very wary about, you know, touching those cases where it is largely based on the collateral and all. Right. So guarantee mechanism to, I mean, okay. uh, end my <laughs> submission to you, yes, guarantee mechanism is the answer for anything and it need not be limited only to MSCs. The time has come where we have to start thinking. In fact, the private uh, uh, personal loans also should be guaranteed. Ultimately, Apple is showing us that. You go to Apple store, Apple and Bajaj FinServ, or any, any person is uh, there and uh, immediately they give the EMI. They don't do any uh, any, any, any assessment and all. Why do, do, do they do that? Because it is being based on the kind of guarantee being given by the Apple itself. Apple wants to penetrate the market, so if anybody he fails to repay, the EMIs are waved off by the Apple. So the same thing could be done. Ultimately, it is not only the investment being done, the personal loans are also equally important. So a time should come, or would come, hopefully, where even those things are, uh, you know, based on the guarantee mechanism, to have the multiplier effect, and we ultimately we see a very larger picture. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, uh, closing remarks, I, I because we actually I uh, uh, ending up. Ah, so, sure. uh, yeah. Sir, is it not if, I mean, unfair uh, in on financial prudence when a corporate, a big, big uh, loan, loan, uh, loan companies, they go for, uh, like, wind up or they go to NCLT, then the consortium of banks, they have to lose thousands of, tens of thousands of crores when we talk about those big, I mean, the big shark. Uh, so isn't it a financial, I mean, unfairness that they, they give a major blow to the financial viability of the banks where banks have to face the loss? And is not that, that major loss affecting the, uh, the affecting the, I mean, risk-taking uh, ability of uh, banks towards the MSME sector? Is it not, is not MSME being, uh, facing a hurdle and a problem to access to finance due to this big defaulter shark tank, sharks. No, I think you're right. That That's uh, unfortunately the reality of the day we have to face it. Because see, look, let's look at it this way. All that large credits which went wrong and which have gone wrong in the past, obviously the NCLT, the IBC mechanism was at least created an exit route. Everything was stuck and stuck forever. So at least it has given a route, but you're right, there are heavy haircuts happening. Haircuts happening to the tune of 60, 70, 80%. And ultimately, realization is 40% hota hai. So, and there are heavy losses. I mean, I agree. And that, as we said, and that's why I said, perhaps, if we norms alag karenge for small borrowers and large borrowers, maybe things may get better equated out. That's the only solution. But yes, we have to live with the reality of the day. No. I'll just quickly uh, point out for the benefit of the house because the subject says re-strategizing credit. So let's also appreciate today, if you look at, a lot of lenders are getting into collaborative lending, which was not there in the past. So RBI came up with this fantastic product of co-lending where today a bank and NBFC sign an agreement together and they lend together. So it's like 
इफ समबडी नीड्स हंड्रेड रुपीज एटी रुपीज बैंक देता है ट्वेंटी रुपीज एन देती है बैंक अपना रेट चार्ज करता है एन अपना चार्ज करती है कस्टमर को एक ब्लेंडेड रेट मिलता है बेनिफिट हेयर इज दैट द बैंक इज एबल टू केट इट टू अगमेंट विच इट अदरवाइज वुड नॉट हैव डन सो एन को इस बेनिफिट ये है कि इट गेट्स दैट राइंड ऑफ rates which it could not have got so it is an win win situation for all the three stakeholders similarly even sidbi has started getting into co lending so i think this collaborative lending is going to be the way forward especially to address the concerns of the msme borrowers but my question is that if you could answer to it that the gov say government uh, or ministry of finance how is it going to tackle that problem of uh, big haircuts there should be strong stringent rules for it What, what what is being done is anything being done by on government part or ministry of finance part sir i think perhaps you should have asked this to the government people present in the morning <laughs> session i'm sorry uh, because i'm there with you on on what you are raising the points which you're trying to make uh, uh, yeah question here and one more here in fact uh, uh, sandeep just message me saying like you know we have 10 more minutes for questions so that's good we can actually yeah. take more questions here yeah uh, i have uh, for mr sandeep so uh, the guarantees which you offer to the banks uh, since they are your client so is it like a, they present you 100% of the cases or uh, they are also selective in presenting you to uh, sanction the guarantee <coughs> no they are selective of course they are selective but we would like see up to 10 lakh the rbi mandates that they cannot take collateral so only option they have is to give unsecured or to give uh, through a guarantee bag mechanism so it, i i would uh, feel that up to 10 lakh they would be taking guarantee under uh, cgt msc more than uh, 10 lakh of course it is the prerogative of the bank whether they want to cover it under guarantee mechanism or they want to do the other way around uh, if you ask me i would be very happy if they bring their entire book to me because that would lessen my uh, risk uh, in 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 them because Uh, there i am with you i mean i keep telling uh, uh, to nbfcs also i i keep telling them that if you are coming and if you are bringing the, your entire book to me i am more confident mm -hmm. because otherwise the cherry picking could be done and then i could uh, end up uh, flat on my face so, so but to answer your question right now it is uh, the prerogative of the lending institution yeah, yeah. so it depends on the bank uh, you know if they want to present the case or not yes yes and my second question is regarding the startup so is there any grant schemes uh, for startups uh, or is it only lending the lending scheme of course uh, lending uh, investing schemes are there where which uh, for which uh, various uh, schemes are there fund of fund for startup the dpit is there which of course is being maintained by uh, sidbi then i believe there is a seed capital fund also is there out of which the seed capitals are given through the incubators and all so this also is there it is being run by dpit but just go to the website of dpit and check it out i am just telling from my own experience okay thank you uh, i am maxen sharma i am former director from msme and i am also running msme unit in my family the gentleman he asked the question so we have a f one factory in kundli one factory in dehradun one factory in amdavad the manufacturing processes are world class and the banker and the turnover annual turnover is 15 crore rupees implying 100 percent the only mantra of success was that never go default with the banker no the bank bank of baroda and punjab national bank दे रिंग दी डायरेक्टर शर्मा जी कैसे हो मैं आपके साथ लंच करना चाहता हूँ ही विल कम दे अरे भाई कुछ लो हमारे से पैसा सो दी बैंक आर लुकिंग गुड बारोर एंड बारोर आर ऑल्सो लुकिंग गुड बैंक आई एम ऑल्सो मेंटर ऑफ भारतीय युवा शक्ति ट्रस्ट वी हैव एन ऑफिस हियर लुकिंग आफ्टर हरियाणा एंड दिल्ली दी प्रॉब्लम इज वी हैव एम ओ यू साइन विद eight bank including one to two private bank when the loan <coughs> application is sent to the branch the branch manager is a young person having engineering background or mba very positive but the he does not have the sanctioning power the sanctioning power is with the regional manager who is going to retire very soon and he says bhai si agar kharab ho gaya meri pension ruk jayegi mera cbi aa jayega wo aa jayega वो इतना डर है कि वो अपना टाइम पास करता है वो सेंक्शन नहीं करता 
This is a practical problem <coughs> which is being faced up with our micro and small and medium enterprise. And uh, 15 days back, we have sent proposal of eight of 35 <coughs> lakh rupees to the bank. Abhi tak uska koi pata bata hi nahi hai, wo time gain kar rahe hai. And other thing is, Resurgent India, one of the top financial institutions in the country, they have carried out survey in 22-23. According to that, there is a total demand of 60 lakh crore rupees of loans by the MSME. And actually, there is a uh, gap of more than 25 lakh crore. And now I want to ask this question from you. How this, we are saying, ke so many things. Lekin wo gap jo hai, in spite of CGMTC Kaag B guarantee ke lava, there is the hesitation. Abhi jo apna development commissioner ne bataya ke jo informal sector mein 8 crore unit registered ho gaya hai, jin ki turnover 5 crore hai, wo jo hai, wo to hesitate karte hai, bank mein jane se, Bank घबराते हैं वो कि बैंक में क्या लोन मिलेगा ये सारी चीजें जो हैं इसको कैसे आप ये इसको सुधारोगे so that bank small man एक village का आदमी छोटे शहर का आदमी sir while I fully appreciate your pain points मैं आपको एक चीज बता देता हूँ कि the entire focus on whether you mentioned about prime minister's visit or विकसित भारत और जो हो रहा है इसमें and whenever there is a talk of MSMEs if you ask me, the one and the only issue being discussed is credit. So if we say that this discussion is happening minus the credit gap, I think there you need to correct yourself. The entire focus of everybody is on the credit gap. Now there are a lot of things I cannot share on this platform. Lot of things happening. Behind the scene, lot of works are being done. Efforts are being made. And already you see some changes. Where were you the, getting the credit? Look at the COVID times when government came up with the emergency credit line. It was available off the shelf. And so things are changing. Let's not be very critical. But I agree, things are will take time. The, as you rightly mentioned, the mindset of the people working at the ground, that needs to change. Government has done it. But implement it. So that mindset needs to change. And that's where I can take that, yes, the NBFC experience to that extent is very, very different because you will find, as I said, I have said that we have to do our survival and growth in our own So I think actually if you look at, the, that is where this, this NBFC segment has flourished. But with due respect, what you are saying is correct. Uh, just to add to what uh, uh, Mr. Raman has said, see, as again the topic is re -strategizing. So what you are saying, this could be taken care of uh, in times to come by what uh, people like uh, Jakarta is doing. See, the issue is the fear, as you said, the fear is there that CBI, uh, CBI Ajayaga and all, it's there. So how do we remove this fear is by removing the subjectivity in a, in a, in a sanctioning or the loaning process and bring objectivity. The more we get it, uh, uh, database, the more we get it analyzed, analytical data, b b b uses of analytical data, and the more we do it cash flow based and all, and the more parameterized lending that we do, the lesser would be the problem. In Sidby, we have done that. Uh, a certain categories of loan, it is all parameterized. The boxes are to be ticked. If all the boxes are ticked, the case is sanctioned. And in the worst case scenario, if the case goes bad, suppose God forbid, so no accountability is because he is meeting all the parameters. Yeah. So if that kind of a thing is done, and there I will also pitch in because the other segment uh, where the problem comes in is the security creation. You know, when you go for a security, a lot of subjectivity is there, whether the land is free, it's not there, legal title clearance, valuation and all. So there CGT, uh, institution like CGT Music can, can, be, can be brought in. So a parameterized lending, Bagged on a very uniform, very secular guarantee scheme could be the answer of the day, and we are moving in that direction. Uh, I mean, many of the banks they have taken a call that up to a certain amount it will be all CGMC based, uh, CGMC guarantee based, without taking any uh, security. So the purpose or the aim there also is to move from subjectivity towards objectivity. The moment we do it, uh, or to what extent we can do it, that will answer your question. Right. 
I think we are completely out of time now. Uh, we have the next uh, panel also to uh, think. So, I'd like to thank all the panelists over here. Maybe we can take a few of these questions offline as well. Uh, the panelists are here. And I'd like to thank you all for being here and for this very interesting session. And I hope you got some good takeaways from it.